has to stop. It has to stop commercially. It has to stop residentially. There are better ways. There's regenerative ag. We can do it differently. And I cannot wait to see how we can make this a better world if we listen. These are not broken kids. They're messengers. Absolutely. Dr. Jill Krista, my dear friend and naturopathic colleague, I'm so happy to have you here today on the Dr. Tina show. We're going to be talking about your new book, which you just released called A Light in the Dark. It's about pandas and pans, such an incredibly important topic. Really excited to have you on today. And uh, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. It's such an honor. Thank you. Thank you. And I love chatting with not just friends, but colleagues, because then we really get into like the good stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. We speak the same language. We understand, right. we understand the same paradigm, which yes. I think it's fun for the audience because there's a lot of people on my audience who didn't know what naturopathic physicians were before they found me. And I hope that they're learning that we do things a bit differently. Mm -hmm. You really embody naturopathic medicine at its root. So I am excited about this. So tell me about this book. What, like, how did this even come to be? Cause I know you as a mold expert, I think the audience probably knows you as a mold expert and that you, and I know your first book was about mold, but I know this was a kind of a passion project you'd been telling me about for years. And then it just happened and I didn't know it came out until recently. So tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, mold is a very common cause of pandas and pans that's getting missed. And so kind of in that same theme of my mold practitioner training courses, are you missing mold illness in your patients? Because the answer for me was yes, for many years. And now it's that, are you missing mold illness as the cause of pandas and pans? Still the answer is yes. You know, and so everybody's talking about these conditions about strep, 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 strep. And strep is very important in both conditions. Strep is what sets off pandas and strep can be a problem for causing flares in a kid with pans. However, it's not just the bug as we know it's the terrain and the bug, it's both. It's not either or, it's both. And so I felt like this is just the natural extension of talking about mold and some of the sequela that I tend to have almost two decades of in the trenches experience with my twins who have pans and there's therefore the passion project. And then realizing, oh, mold was at the root of this for so many of my patients too, as I learned about mold. And so that's our connection and why I'm talking about it. Awesome. I feel like, well, first we need to tell the audience the difference between pandas and pans. And uh, I have always seen it kind of clinically be the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert. I've seen it in patients who came in diagnosed. I've suspected it in patients and even in my own daughter, um, but no formal diagnosis, but I have always, it always just like so many things, it seems to show up as like the perfect storm, like the perfect situation of different variables come together and boom, here we are. Yeah. So can you tell the audience the difference between the two and then maybe speak to what I just mentioned? Sure. So pan does, they're both pediatric. They're both acute onset. However, there are kids who are being diagnosed with PANS who were a slower onset. So they probably had congenital stealth infections like Lyme disease, Bartonella, Babesia. So they never developed a normal immune system. So their onset may take over a month instead of that overnight thing. But we don't have another diagnosis for them. So we lump them into PANS right now inappropriately, you know, but that's where we're at. So the pediatric part needs to be there, meaning they need to be under 18. However, there are a lot of adults who have this, that the onset was during their teens and they got put into psych wards or handled with just the psych medication and not the autoimmune piece. So, but for a classic, it's a pediatric acute onset neuropsych syndrome of some kind. So suddenly behavior changes. And the unfortunate thing about PANDAS when it first came on is it was first identified at the National Institutes of Mental Health. Well, you and I both know what mental health is. It's the low man on the totem pole. It's the bastard child of the medical world. It does not get the attention that it should. It kind of gets written off as like not a real thing. And so I think it was sort of, um, it was debunked or tried to be debunked by people just because I think it was in the mental health sphere. And now we're understanding more and more, which, you know, naturopathic doctors and chiropractors have understood this. That's why, you know, alignment is so important. What happens in the body shows up in the brain. What happens in the body shows up in how the brain functions, brain chemistry, brain cognitive, 
processing, all of those kind of things. So these are going to be kids who all of a sudden, and that all of a sudden, I just kind of qualified that. What does that all of a sudden look like? Have an infection or have enough of something happen, which could be the flu in a pan's case. It could be the strep in a pandas case. So it has to, pandas has to be a strep onset. However, it doesn't necessarily have to be that they had strep throat. Strep perianitis, which is a perianal strep infection, is a very common, often missed reason for pandas to start and for pans to flare. So, and they may have gotten it an exposure from a sibling. So the sibling got strep, but the perfect storm was just at that threshold where that kid could have that little bit of strep exposure, not getting sick, but can be triggered by. And so if a sibling gets strep, all of a sudden now you can end up with the kid with pandas start to display the symptoms. And the symptoms are OCD, which in a kid, we have to kind of parse apart what that looks like. OCD is technically obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessions are thoughts, compulsions are behaviors. Well, a kid isn't going to be able to necessarily have the vocabulary to say, I'm really worried about something. Like, I feel like we're going to get in a car accident on my way to school every day. So the compulsion, the behavior is to do something that makes them feel like they're in control of their life before they can get in the car and go to school. But they can't necessarily describe for you that's what the obsession is. So it's obsessive compulsive disorder, which is going to look a little different in a kid than like an adult. It may look the same with repeated hand washing opening and closing doors and things like that. But it also could look a little bit different. It could look at like intrusive thoughts, anxiety, and we also see tick disorder in both. And then in PANS, it's going to be something more like a regression, a behavioral regression or aggression. And we might see hand, we often see actually handwriting will deteriorate kind of all of a sudden, or they are in art class and they can't, and they have a left, left-sided, um, well, I'm blanking on the term, but they don't notice the left side. So they are they can do everything on the right side perfectly. And the left side just looks like a big lump of things. And it's not accurate. For me, I feel like, oh, if we could teach every art teacher, every teacher and every school nurse about these common things that will happen when a kid goes from perfect storm threshold to all of a sudden converting into autoimmune disease, that would be beautiful because we could catch it early enough before it really gets to take hold. It's crazy because I've like, as you're describing this, I'm remembering back to my own childhood and it's very, I mean, it's very much that it's like acute onset, hypersensitivity, kind of obsessive disorder. You nail it when you can't get the concern out, but you're highly concerned. So for me, I had to have little tissues, Kleenex. I had to have Kleenex folded perfectly into perfect little squares and in place in every single pocket on my body before I would leave the house when I was in kindergarten, or I would Mm. melt down. (laughs) Interesting. I I couldn't stand having seams touch me or tag. So I had to take the seams of my sock and I would spend literally a half an hour hysterically crying, trying to get the seam folded over the top of my foot just right. So I could get it in my shoe. So none of it bothered my toes. And to this day, I can't stand shoes. So, I mean, it's these little things. And the reason I share this is because I was diagnosed with a hypersensitivity disorder and a hyperactivity disorder. They didn't really have like official terms for any of it, but Mm -hmm. it was definitely a neuroinflammatory situation. I, I, it's clear as day for me looking back, but I share it only because we might see a spectrum, right? We may not see these Frank cases. We may see these small little behavioral change. My daughter had a lot of strange little behaviors as well that were glimmers of this. And I, I really did. I discounted it. You know, I had a chiropractic professor in 2004 teach us about this and I forgot about it. And then I saw it again in naturopathic school, kind of forgot about it. And then we've had a few colleagues with children who've suffered with this. And so, and then I was like, holy smokes, that's what happened to my daughter in fifth grade. Just lights went out, boom, massive change. Similarly for me as well. So I, I think that a lot of parents are probably struggling with glimmers of these conditions in their children, I would guess. I mean, am I, am I oversimplifying it or? No, no, we, it's our environment is very pro neuroinflammation. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that about neuroinflammation because it is a, I see it as a spectrum that there is a building neuroinflammation that happens. And then there's some trigger that then it converts to autoimmune. 
And once it converts to autoimmune, we can't necessarily use everything for a kid or an adult that we can use for generalized neuroinflammation. Because once it converts to autoimmune, it starts attacking itself. And the places in the brain where it's attacking is related to dopamine, glutamate, and acetylcholine. So these oh. kids end up swimming in excitatory brain chemistry. So if we give them what we would normally, you know, oh, it's good for the brain, it's good for neuroinflammation. If we gave them turmeric, if we give them boswellia, um, schizandra, or you want to calm a kid down, you give them lemon balm, passion flower, none of those are appropriate for a kid in a flare because they're dopaminergic. They're going to increase the dopamine glutamate problem. Wow. So, and I'm all alone on this, by the way, we have colleagues that use turmeric and say they use it just fine. I want to challenge every colleague. <laughs> so I'm a little sassy. Have you ever done it as a monotherapy and then watched? It's beautiful in between a flare because it is dopaminergic. Between flares, these kids can hit the rock bottom dopamine rock bottom. They feel despair. They feel depression. So it's this flare, calm, flare, calm. And there's tends to be with pandas and pans about a three month wave form on that flare, calm cycle. Um, but during a flare, I do not use those. And my patients taught me that, you know, it was just, that's the thing that the same thing with mold. And I don't use, you know, medicinal mushrooms in the early stages of mold treatment for the same reason or kombucha. Cause my patients got worse after I made this grand recommendation, you know, I'm like, oh, mushrooms are good for the immune system. Well, it's immune suppressive. You need to do this. And then they had neuro, all their neurological stuff got worse. You I are nailing it. Hands. I, 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 oh yeah. Cause I, I would agree completely from a personal standpoint and from a professional standpoint, having dealt with people in pain, I used to just dose copious amounts of curcumin upon patients yeah. and it's not great in a flare for many people. It's nope. not, it's great in between for mitigating, but it in a flare, when you can't get out and you're in so much pain, you can't see straight, uh, throwing curcumin at it either does nothing or potentially, I feel like it sends people a little bit off the edge. So, yeah, which would make sense. Cause dopamine can go either direction. You know, it's, it's an, it, if the soup is excitatory, it will go that direction more preferentially. So yeah, I mean, then you just get agitation of whatever was the pre-existing problem. So, and why do that when we have so many other tools? We have so many tools as naturopathic doctors in the plant world and the supplement world, even using NSAIDs, steroids, if, if a kid is really close to self-harm, you know, these are all of our tools when we do integrative medicine. So why use something that could have that risk, you know? Right. Right. It's hard to say because this, this is such a great point to bring up. You know, we both have supplements we sell online. We both have an online presence and people want the thing for the thing. What can I take for this? And I'm like, that's not how this works. I wish it were that simple. And I try to sell really benign supplements that don't necessarily, um, you know, it's not a thing, a pill for a thing, but this pill for every ill model, it's, specifically in when it comes to neuroinflammation, specifically in children. I mean, we're, this is not the solution, right? And we see this with a lot of, and not to throw the functional medicine doctors under the bus, but a lot of them are still kind of a pill for every ill and not understanding. Well, a great example is I had a functional medicine colleague come into my office once with a child who was dealing with some juvenile arthritis and they clear as day were like, we're not keen on changing lifestyle and diet. Like that's not something that we're willing to budge on right now. And I, I just remember thinking, and I've heard another colleague say a very similar thing about a, a, a chiropractic, uh, a, a child of a chiropractor. And it's like, yo, how can we even touch this without lifestyle, massive right. lifestyle? Like sometimes you got to move the kid, you got to move the whole family right? Like to another state. Yeah. So well, that's why I have like the top four bad guys that set the stage. I call it, you know, stacking the straws in my book, which a lot of people are so familiar with that. You know, the camel on the straw that broke the camel's back. What stacks the straws is all the environmental stuff and our wackadoodle schedules, you know, adrenal fatigue. Nobody can convalesce anymore. No one gets to stay home. Why is this post strep? Well, because we, the miracle of antibiotics, if a kid is diagnosed with strep, we say, okay, they can go back to school 24 hours after antibiotics start. Well, are they well enough to go back to school after that? Not a lot of them. Like strep is a big deal. 
big deal on a body. And so the top four, my no-nos or, you know, my, uh, my bad guys, the first one is pesticides and then mold and then EMFs and then mercury. And then you probably can guess what five is in this controversial time, but you know, those things ruin the gut and we have a gut brain connection. And if we have a messed up gut, that's for me, why it tips into autoimmune. Like we really have a good understanding of what other is. And we're talking about autoimmune, like the body knows the immune system knows what is other it's a microbe, you know, a bacteria, virus, parasite, that kind of thing. Well, uh, the immune system also has to be really clear about what is self. And we are more microbe than man. There's more DNA and more cells, just count, just a head count than there are in our whole body in our microbiome. So if we're eating the lifestyle stuff or, you know, eating things that are killing the microbiome, now the body's like, I'm not really sure what self is. I've, I've kind of lost track of that. And so that biomimicry, that crossover can happen so much more. So diet is absolutely important. These kids can also have eating problems. So I try to really just narrow it down to organic. Just as simple as that. Like you don't have to have this bad food list or whatever, you know, like how many people had food allergies when we were kids before this was so rampantly used, you know, glyphosate and Roundup and all oh the weed goodness. killers. Yeah. It's so you crazy. didn't see it. And now everybody has it. You know, I mean, I remember graduating from naturopathic school, coming to the Midwest and telling people, you know, about gluten allergy. And they're like, that's not even a thing. You know, people used to make fun of me. <laughs> our gluten free things were two products on the shelf that I had to beg our grocery store to bring in. And now it's two aisles long. Something has changed, you know? Yeah. So of course, could there be other things that would be more perfect, like going on, a, you know, not meat and potatoes, but meat and vegetable diet? Yeah, that would, that would be amazing. And high, good fats. I, you know, we could pick apart the diet. There's a perfect world diet, but how about just start with organic? Because the pesticides are confusing your bodies, all of us, but particularly these kids, they're confusing what is self. So it doesn't know what's non-self and it's self-attacking. It's wild how much even carbohydrates impact me since I went far more carnivore. Um, mm -hmm. I'm shocked at the neuropsychiatric impact of carbohydrates on me. I mean, they literally make me high. Literally. Yeah. I was just hosting my event, you know, my live event I had in Arizona and you were so kind to send me those, those text messages of support, <laughs> wishing me luck. But I, on the first day we had sweet potatoes and normally I only eat sweet potatoes at night when I'm about to sit down and watch a show with my husband. So I don't notice it. Right. Cause I'm <laughs> like, I'm already like tired and going to sleep or, you know, kind of on my way out for the day, but I had sweet potatoes at lunch with some beets. I never eat. I really never eat vegetables anymore. And I had a couple things I don't normally eat really starchy, carb heavy. And man, I was a mess that first hour of lecturing afterwards. I couldn't even get the words out. And it wasn't just brain fog. Like I felt like I was high. Mm -hmm. I felt like I'd eaten a marijuana gummy or something. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> and I'm going to teach. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's probably something that I'm sure has, uh, gotten worse over time, but I'm sure that was an, a thing for me as a young person. I'm sure all of the, you know, if someone had just put me on ribeye steaks when I was in fourth grade, right. my life would have been remarkably different. So I'm not telling these parents to go strict carnivore, but consider dietary changes and getting particularly, I, I I'm not the expert, but just from my own naturopathic perspective, like getting refined carbohydrates out even if they say they're organic, just, I get so much shit online for saying, you know, why are you buying like these swap outs that people have, like swap out these for gluten-free Oreos or whatever, right, like, right. Just, just get rid of the Oreos. No Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a hard thing to hear this time of year as we're like dead into winter and sugar season. But I think if parents were just to remove refined sugar from their kid's diet, they would notice. And I, I this has everything to do with our whole body system, but just the impact on the brain is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Yes. And that's a, that there's, therein lies the mold connection because a lot of people who have mold and mycotoxin exposure have yeast overgrowth and yeast makes gliotoxin, which is like a neurotoxin to the brain it goes right to the brain. So that's, I, those were always the patients after I learned this the hard way by having a patient call me suicidal because she, I had just put her on a yeast formula and I didn't do 
the prep, you know, I didn't have the bioflavonoids to make sure she was pooping and have the binder and, you know, all of the things that now I'm like, wait a minute, before you start antifungals, we've got to do all these things. And it, now I just warn people. I'm like, okay, yeast, if you have yeast overgrowth, it goes right to your mind. And oh, it's terrible. Yep. Right to the brain, the mood, especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like complete psychotic breaks. Yeah. It's bad. You're so right. It happened. It's so- addictive. Well, you helped me. I was about to buy a house in Arizona. Just, I got to say this off topic. Everybody thinks I moved to Arizona and I have no idea where, how that happened. I did not move to Arizona. I was looking for a second home in Arizona to spend my winters in. And I was looking at a house that had mold and you were like, no, you're not buying that house, which I (laughs) really appreciate your, your input. You're so funny. You were like, this is the point usually where people hang up on me. And I was like, why would I hang up on you? I was asking for your expertise (laughs) and you gave it. So I'll listen, but, um, I appreciate your input on that. Anyway, the point is, is when I was down there, I stayed in a hotel that had black mold and it was wallpapered over. You could even see it seeping through. And I don't think my husband believed me on the impact that mold has on my brain. And interestingly, I've seen it repeatedly where I've stayed in hotels and I started seeing my partner act aberrantly. And I'm like, dude, there's mold in here because he's acting psycho and he never acts psycho. Right. And so- I lost my mind and one of our colleagues called in a formula to the compounding pharmacy for me, which was an antibiotic and an antifungal in a nose spray form. And I hit, it was high dose. And I only, I halved it. I, I diluted the formula in half, shot it up my nostrils. And within 45 minutes, I thought my I thought I was going to melt down and die. I can't even describe it. I clearly had mold going on and I don't think it was just from the hotel room. I think it was from the season prior and Mm -hmm. all of a sudden it all released, like it all died off. And I had a massive Herxheimer reaction and I went and sat in my friend's sauna for like an hour and a half crying, hysterical crying because I couldn't get my brain to stop melting down on me. Yeah, And it really hit home for me. Like we can't be hitting these people hard and fast. This is right. why trying to solve your remedies at, or your, your problems at home without the input of an expert is problematic, in my opinion. Well, thank God you have the sauna. I mean, that that's why that's part of my protocol in my mold book is that, you know, it is so important for moving all those toxins, like mycotoxins, mold toxins are fat soluble. So they build up and they accumulate in your fat stores, which, you know, as a doctor, we're, we are thinking brain, nervous system, myelin sheathing over the nerves, um, immune system, bone marrow, organs, glands, linings, you know, lining of our gut. Like it's so much more than just booty fat, even though that's part of it, you know, (laughs) that's the part of where it goes, but more critically, it's going to first go into those organ systems. And sauna is so important to get all of that fat stuff moved, fat soluble stuff moved. There's only a few things that do that. That's why we use binders and I use bio movers too, because if you're, if the body can't get rid of it through the kidneys, it'll accumulate in the tissues. And it also goes to the liver. The liver has to package that up in bile. And then we have to pick that up, you know, that bile and make new, fresh, clean bile. Well, in a lot of people, if you have been accumulated with, you know, just live in Portland for a year or two. (laughs) (laughs) Or half your life. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And like that explains a lot that why you had that big meltdown is it not only is like a message of make sure you prep your patient, but also a confirm confirmation of like this, this colonization thing is real. And if you're colonized, every time you breathe in, you're taking in those mycotoxins and your body has to figure out what to do with it. And, you know, those topical things, like I use uh, mud baths, um, they're, they're wonderful for kids, like really, really little kids. We have to be a little careful with sauna. So that's a thing there. But, you know, sauna is part of that because it's so good at sweating all that stuff out. You talk about this, you know, getting hot. It's so important. Oh, I love, I love my sauna. I was having a particularly hard few days and I couldn't stop. I mean, I, it, I was exhausted. So I first put myself to bed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like, I'm just going to give myself permission Go to bed, to young lady. <laughs> as much as I need. Yeah. But then, you know, the next, the minute I kind of came to and realized I, I had rested enough, I was like, I'm going to cook the shit out of myself for the next few days and get this stuff moving. And it's, it is an instant remedy. It's instant. Uh-huh. I instantly have brain clarity. I instantly come out with a mood boost. I instantly come out with clarity around what my next best steps are. It's like, you're so Mm -hmm. engrossed in the mess that you can't decide what your next best step is. And so I go get hot and then suddenly I'm 
I'm, I'm on again, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay. I know how to take care of myself from here. I know what I need to do. Maybe it's exercise. Maybe the next step is whatever it is, but it gives me that motivational push and that clarity that I can't seem to find when I'm swimming in the, in the muck and the mire of my neuroinflammation. Right. 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 And then with, you know, where we tip it then into pandas pans, a lot of these kids have mass. So excess mast cells, it might not be to the point of mast cell activation syndrome, but if you have the combination, you know, the, the dirty four of like weed killer mold EMFs and mercury, those are all potent mast cell stimulators. And so they may be someone who flares from exercise or flares from sauna. So there's a little prep you do to make sure that they can have that necessary therapy. You know, there's mast cell stabilizers. Uh, and those are important no matter what you're doing with these kids, because even being exposed to cold air and then coming back in and they can have a mast cell flare and that's going to go to their brain if they have a pre-primed brain. I call it the, the um, monkeys in the mind. I call the microglia the monkeys in the mind. Um, hashtag monkeys uh, because <laughs> in the brain. They're just like, they're basically macrophages, which means they're the kinds of cells that can move around and they take care of infections, but also debris and things that shouldn't be there. And so they can, I think of them as like swimming or swinging around the neurons, you know, just like out there, just, you know, eating the garbage and doing whatever it needs to do to keep everything all clean there's two thirds of our brain is immune. Only a third is the thinking part, which is amazing. You know, if you start to think about that. So when we talk about neuroinflammation, that means two thirds of your brain can light up. That's, that's an impressive amount of neuroinflammation. And if you have something that makes it into the brain, what we see is that with strep, what makes it kind of uniquely notorious is that by having a strep exposure, um, you know, we don't, one strep doesn't give us immunity to the next strep coming down the pike. And strep is unique because it has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of strains. So no one is going to get off this planet being immune to all strains of strep. It's just not going to happen. So that's why it's such a problem. And once we get exposed to strep, it will send out TH17, which is a highly inflammatory cytokine. And that can ride right up the nasal barrier, right up the olfactory bulb into the brain. So it gets a free elevator ride right up into the brain. Mycotoxins can do the same thing. And that's how it can end up in the brain. So even if it's not something that we know to cross the blood brain barrier, it doesn't have to do that. So strep is a real bad guy for this, but all intranasal infections are preferentially generating that cytokine. And that cytokine is highly inflammatory. I joke that it uses a grenade when a butter knife would do, you know, like it's that kind of a, you know, kind of think of like a hopped up dude in the military, like, whoa, take them out. You know, <laughs> it's the Marines. It's, it's the Marines. Marines. <laughs> well, it's the, it's like shooting flies with a shotgun. There you go. Yeah. That's a great, that's what Rick used to always say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's... you get all this inflammation. And then once the microglia get, get that TH17, they lose their arms. They can't swing around anymore. And that makes mm. the monkeys really upset. And so upset monkeys fling poo. They fling more, <laughs> more cytokines. So, and then if another monkey is swinging by and it gets the cytokine poo from the mad monkey, it'll make that one lose its arms and that will sit. So you get these clusters in the brain. And what we see in, the, in a kid with pandas and pans is that cluster is happening at the basal ganglia. And that is the thing, that area of the brain explains all the symptoms. Yes. Now they have too much Talk dopamine. About yeah. Yeah. I mean, basal ganglia is a, it's one of our, I call it the reptilian part of the brain. You know, it's one of our survival areas. So if you have a kid who's repeatedly hand-washing, that's not a bad symptom. They're telling you something. My barriers are down. No one around me is washing their hands. So now I got to wash my hands for them. You know, so some of these compulsions we can really use them as information so that we can help a kid and support them where they're asking for help. And I think too, that these neuroinflammatory situations are probably particularly devastating in the developing brain versus the already developed brain. So I can see exactly. why strep would be problematic. Let me ask you a question. Cause I get this one often. My daughter actually just asked this of me. Cause I mentioned to her that I think what she might've been dealing with as a younger person was pandas or pans. And so she went looking into it and she said, 
So if I had strep throat and you didn't treat me with antibiotics, would that put me more at risk? Can this you talk about that? Really, a we don't know yet. And that's where we need science. But in countries that have socialized medicine, so everything is, all the data is there. They've done retro, retrospective studies. There was one in Denmark where they found that the kids who were treated with antibiotics for their strep infections later in life had a, had a higher risk of developing some kind of mental health issue. Wow. Yeah. And that's just the first thing we throw at people. Right. Everybody. Uh, you know, now strep has some serious sequelae. Yeah. You know, it can wreck your kidneys. It can wreck your heart. You know, there's a lot, it's not just something to kind of go, Oh, you know, you could, you could have a mental health issue if you take antibiotics. No, you have to look at every family, every situation, but this is why I have what I call the botanical avatars for, for pandas and pans, because these are, if there is a perfect world in a perfect world, there'd be a tool that we could use that is antimicrobial, anti-neuroinflammatory, balances brain chemistry, helps the gut, you know, just, uh, just go down the whole list, like do, 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 do all the things that we would like. We have a ton of plants that do this. We have a ton. So, so Chinese skullcap, Oregon grape root, Buplurum. Um, I mean, I could, Bacopa, there's all these things. So not necessarily it's good for the brain, but it's good for the brain and it, it corrects the brain chemistry imbalance rather than make it worse. How does Bacopa help the brain? Because it's always in these nootropic formulas. I know. <laughs> yeah, good question. It's a, there's a lot of science about what it's doing. But if you, when we think about the mechanism being the mad monkeys, the microglia, Bacopa has some specific activity on calming down microglia. Ah, uh, so okay. That's the, yep. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of blood flow issues or blood flow correction, inflammation correction from being a specific antioxidant to fat, fatty tissues like the brain. Um, but it, it has a great activity on the microglia. I have it in my brain spark product and I love my brain spark product. It has a couple different ingredients in there that are just so phenomenal for being able to get yourself to think clearly. And mm -hmm. a lot of questions that I get around it are, I already tend towards anxiety or I tend towards, you know, I don't want to take something that's going to send me over the edge brain spark. The spark part makes them feel a little mm -hmm. concerned. And I'm like, no, no, no. Nine times out of 10 people do so well on it. I think it's yeah. such a, a nice product for being able to get your cognition in check. I I'm like that adult that has the ADHD who always used it as a superpower until I hit perimenopause and it started turning into a disaster. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, and you're like, okay, suddenly I can't sleep <laughs> even when I want to. And I've stayed up too late. Yeah. Well, I'm a good sleeper. I just can't seem to gather my thoughts. So I use Bacopa in my brain spark. I use that product a lot to keep myself on task. Um, also acetylcholine. Let's talk about that because you mentioned that with mold and I'm assuming also pans and pandas. Yes. What is Talk about that in the brain. Cause I don't think people understand this very well. Yeah. Well, we don't necessarily know what is happening specifically with acetylcholine in the brain yet with the pandas and pans kids. So much of this is just burgeoning you know, research, mm -hmm. but what some recent research is showing that there's some damage of inter of cholinergic interneurons. So interneurons is between the neurons. Um, and so if there's damage of those, that's how you can get the looping. That's how you can get the ticks. That's how you can get the intrusive thoughts that keep coming and they keep coming. Um, so I think, you know, by acknowledging it's not just a, um, a strep biomimicry, or there's this, there's this protein on the dopamine receptor, you know, all of this stuff that kind of people that have been in the business have been saying, it's like, it may be that, but it may be something a little more complex than that. And we find that that's the case of strep as well. Strep is so complex to diagnose. A rapid strep is not a sufficient strep assessment. It gives us a yes answer when it's yes, but it doesn't confirm a no answer. You still need to do the culturing. And that's a big thing, you know, that in, in private practice and in, you know, the urgent care, primary care, <laughs> when your ER and your urgent care is your primary care doctor, people aren't getting that follow-up. You know, they're getting a rapid strep. If it's a no, they say you don't have strep. That's not accurate. Really? So, I didn't know that. Yep. So rapid strep, when it's a yes, it's a yes. And that's good to do so we can get going on treatment right away, but a a negative rapid does not confirm a negative strep. So well, it makes sense. I, I've, I've seen a lot of folks 
come up with a negative rapid strep and they still clearly had strep throat. I mean, they, they had all, we treated presumptively anyway. Right. Yeah. And what I just told you about the study, you know, about antibiotics, do I still use antibiotics with some kids? Yeah. But I do all the rest of the stuff, mm-hmm. you know, all the rest of the thing that's going to help with the neuroinflammation, the gut restoration, you know, it's just an antibiotic can send you out the door and go back to school 24 hours later is how we got here, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Right. That is it. People want to say, oh, I'm not contagious. I can go back to school and parents want to use school as the babysitter, which I understand. I was a single mom. I understand. I get it, but it's, it's a tough one. Um, Since we're talking about these things, how does, how does something like influenza COVID all of these different, I know that we've talked about viruses and there's the I think I'm, I think I'm with you in there, you know, are they do, are they exactly as we understand them? Probably not. Is there some truth to this exosome theory? I think it's somewhere in the middle, but either way, what's happening for folks when they are exposed to a really tough bout with a upper respiratory virus infection? Yeah, there are certain viruses that are encephalitic that will go. And I'm with you. I think that this is like a half, half thing. You know, we, a lot of our DNA looks like viruses. So, you know, they, I think they help us evolve. I think they're here to help us move with our planet. (laughs) If it can go into the woo world a little bit and are there exosomes, are there, you know, chunks of tissue that when you have to create a a prep um, that you're creating these, you know, these little bits of things that is might actually be part of our own tissue possibly, but we know that there are certain things that we're calling a virus that are encephalitic and can get into the brain and cause more encephalitis type symptoms, anything in the herpes family, they love the nerves. So that would be, you know, I know you've had your, your bout with that, with the CMV. I mean, it's just and like the herpes, herpes one, herpes two, HHV six, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, all of the varicella, they love the nerve tissue and they are the thing that could be the, the one last straw for a kid to go into pans. Um, also mycoplasma pneumonia, while it's not a virus, that's a really common upper respiratory infection that we would see that will trigger a pans event. That yeah. makes total sense. And for the audience who doesn't know what mycoplasma is, it's kind of not a bacterium and it's kind of not a virus. Like it's like this a cellular bitty, bitty intracellular type bacteria. Yeah. It's really, uh, I mean, and it's, it's technically non-intracellular, but it, it, beca- it behaves badly like that yes. It evades detection by our immune system. And so it's the, it's the classic setup for an autoimmune type trigger. Yes. And mm-hmm. it's really common with walking pneumonia season. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it takes three weeks for symptoms to come on and you can be shedding six weeks after your symptoms abate. Let's talk about super spreader. Like that's a long time that somebody is going to be sharing that, you know? Oh, my plasma is bad. (laughs) And a lot of us don't have any problem at all. There are a lot of asymptomatic, asymptomatic cases of it. So again, it goes back to the terrain idea that if we are not paying attention to how many straws we're stacking on the back of our kids' backs, then a mycoplasma becomes a problem. Yes. And also with, with Lyme, Borrelia, tick-borne relapsing fever, Bartonella, Babesia, these are all things that are stealth infections that a lot of kids with those have mycoplasma pneumonia as a problem because their immune system is so busy trying to keep a lid on this. And you asked about COVID. COVID is on the naughty list for, for causing PANS because of its vagal nerve free ride that it's getting right now. So it's found this way, or the dendritic cells are carrying it to these tissues and the dendritic cells are part of our immune system. They're supposed to be information carrying. So they're supposed to be saying, oh, we have this upper respiratory problem. I'm gonna go tell the spleen or I'm gonna go tell the lymph nodes. And those are the factories so that the immune system can start ramping up a response. But by being carried by dendritic cells, they get carried to the vagus nerve and now it can ride the vagus nerve up to the brain, or at least the cytokines can do that. And so if you have a kid with mad monkeys in their mind, all it takes is a little bit of systemic or whole body inflammation that will trip the trigger and cause a flare. It didn't take, it has to take a new infection in the, in the nose, so to speak. Right. It is. It's really just the straw that broke the camel's back. There's these kids are sitting there with, you know, gosh, I couldn't even imagine being a kid today 
by the way, like no way. difficult, <laughs> challenging. They, they're, we're looking at some of these Gen Zers and we're saying, you know, why are they behaving so aberrantly? They're the first generation to have been hit hard with the vaccine schedule, right? Mm-hmm. So they're really the first generation, especially the older Gen Zers who are voting now, who are, the, you know, these are the people throwing cans of paint on paintings and gluing their hands to, I, I get it. Like I, I totally understand being young and angry mm-hmm. and seeing wrongs in the world and really wanting to change something, but just not having the words or the knowledge or the tools to do anything. It's a very frustrating period. I was there. I've, I've been there. I, I, I would have been a blue haired screaming liberal as well. <laughs> if this were If I were 22, <laughs> I get it. But Um, I think they are a heavily vaccinated lot from their childhood vaccine schedule. And then on top of it, the food supply is so damaged and destructive and they've been hit with so many medications along the ride. And, um, you know, parents are just doing the best they can. And not to mention they're sitting in classrooms full of heavily vaccinated kids. And then we're throwing this MRNA therapy on top of things. And I, you know, fluorescent lighting, moldy schools, chemical cleaners, you know, I mean, it's just no wonder we're here. So I'm hoping that I feel like the kids who are, who are getting this are the bravest soldiers on behalf of the human race and Gaia, our planet to say, this has to stop. Like how important is a weed free yard? Really? Not that important. I really don't care about a weed free yard. Compared to (laughs) having a kid who, you know, won't eat food because they, their swallowing mechanism doesn't work anymore or they won't sleep, you know, or they, they have ticks like that. There've been ticks so severe of the diaphragm that kids pass out. They're sitting in school and they're trying not to tick. So they do this like small ticks and then just pass out. Now you have a head injury. (laughs) But I mean, these kids are getting taken from their parents in the ER against anyone's, you know, permission and put into psych wards. And this is a really serious problem. And I, I feel like we really need to be handing them all awards to say thank you for telling us this is, it has to get severe for us to pay attention and change. So I'm hoping to see policy change. I'm hoping to see, you know, I'm hoping a lot of people read the book and see that about, you know, Roundup and this like, that's got to stop. It has to stop. It has to stop commercially. It has to stop residentially. There are better ways. There's regenerative ag. We can do it differently. And I cannot wait to see how we can make this a better world. If we listen, these are not broken kids. They're messengers. Absolutely. But why right now are we not, why is there not some massive outcry for our children and babies dying in hospitals from a virus that shouldn't be impacting them? Right. The way right. it is. I mean, that's you know? the thing that people, it's, people are like, oh, RSV, RSV. Like this isn't a new virus. This has been around a long time. And there were certain kids, preemies and, you know, kids who had to be on oxygen and that kind of thing, which challenges your respiratory passages. And there were little things that you could do if you knew a kid was kind of, if there was a preterm labor sort of thing, you can give the mom steroid injections to try to speed up development of the lungs and try to prevent this. We've learned a lot about how to manage it. So it wasn't a big deal. It shouldn't be a big deal. So why is it a big deal? You know, and, and then that is, it's a precursor to developing lung issues f- lifelong. Mm-hmm. It can potentially be for some people like asthma and things like that. We're using steam inhalations in our practice. It's beautiful. You know, good old time essential oil. Oh my gosh. Every time. <laughs> doesn't hurt a baby, you know, like it's perfectly fine to do. Yeah. Or a young one. Yeah. We could be doing things so much better. I hope that we can infuse more of the naturopathic methods into hospital care. It could be so profound. Well, it's just common sense care. I mean, if you ask our grandparents, grandmas, grandparents how they <laughs> handle things, I wish, you know, we we're on the flip end of all this, we're seeing so much dementia at mm-hmm. such high rates, which we can contribute to a lot of different things, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was on the same spectrum of what you're speaking on right here with pans and pandas sure. is, is yeah, I think kind of I think Parkinson's Parkinson's is late, late pandas pants. It's all dopamine. So you have this excess flood, 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 an attack of the dopamine receptor, and then eventually the body just stops making dopamine because it makes problems for the body. 
So yeah, I think that this is, and again, I want to, I want people to be thinking of it as a spectrum because pandas and pants is different than a neuroinflammation brain. It's neuroinflammation plus self-attack. So there's this spectrum, but then there's some point where the, the trigger gets tripped and then you have a brain that is primed for self-attack every time it gets, gets a systemic message that, you know, oh, we just sprained our ankle, better start attacking the brain again. You know, oh, we just lost a tooth. That's a really common time to get a flare. Yeah. That would explain a lot of dental problems leading to other issues. Mm-hmm. Dental problems are, are dental and sinus are the most common interference fields for my patients, not just the pandas pans, but you know, the, the mold and neuroinflammation TBI, you know, all these, I specialize in neuroinflammation. So it's amazing how many times there's like a smoldering dental infection or a sinus colonization. And Mm -hmm. it's fantastic to get those taken care of, you know, or a malocclusion like they have, they have because of malnutrition, they don't have their bite correct. And so they don't have oxygenation and glymphatic drainage. And so getting this area corrected is profound for getting someone back together. (laughs) Wow. It's so wild. This is also just to have you say it all together like this is really eye opening, and to think about the repercussions down the line for mm-hmm. folks. And then, so let's let's instill some hope. So if yes. folks folks don't necessarily know where to turn, what what are some easy mm-hmm. one two three steps that people can take if they suspect that they or their child are dealing with this and they don't have an expert in their area? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'll get my book. Yeah. And, uh, I have a joke in there that I have, I could have made this, I have the core four. So you just, the, these are the things to focus on the categories, the things to focus on. I could have made it core 10. <laughs> so uh, I disciplined myself. I was like, what do you need to know right now? Here are the things. And then there is the resilience chapter, which is how do you never end up here again? That's a different thing. That's where the other six things goes. Um, but the core four is first, you got to tame the flame. You've got to get the inflammation down because those monkeys are con- going to continue to fling poo. And the more they can fling, the more monkeys they can get mad, you know, more of their friends can get mad. And then you've just got all this inflammation. So stopping that flinging is super important. So that's core number one. <laughs> got to keep it light if we can. And then we got to beat the bugs. Because there are bugs. There's, we talked about encephalitis viruses, mycoplasma pneumonia, the Lyme co-infection group. We've got strep. Um, we've got COVID in there, influenza. So we have to beat the bugs. And then we have to regulate the immunity. And of course, that goes heavily into gut support. Butyrate is probably my most favorite, favorite things for pandas and pans. And then fourth core is guard the gates. So in the tame the flame, that would be things that are, you might think of them as mast cell managers. So if someone is specializing mast cell, you already know what that is. But if you're a parent and you're like, what the heck is that? You don't even know what that. So starting with vitamin C to stabilize the mast cells. Some kids who have mold can't tolerate vitamin C. So we have tons of other things you can use. Feverfew. It's a beautiful plant, beautiful plant for this. Rosemary. Rosemary has rosmarinic acid, which is a specific acid that can go in. You think acid is probably not a good thing to have on the brain, (laughs) but this is the right kind of acid to put in the brain. It reduces microglial activation. Um, Resveratrol, which that's a crossover between mold and pandas pans. Resveratrol is great for calming down the brain, the flame in the brain, but also for reducing the mycotoxin load in the body and be anti-inflammatory for the whole body, specifically the blood vessels which we're seeing with COVID is a big problem, this infection and irritation of the blood vessels. So you've got um, pine bark and pine needle extract. Like there's some beautiful things that you can do to get that, just the whole neuroinflammation down. And then specific mast cell things might be like a perilla. This is a Chinese herb that's used. It shuts down a particular interleukin that is related to certain infections and mold. So those are kind of like, how do we tame the flame? These are all supplement type things. And of course, then when we move into beat the bugs, you might need to be adding in those topical things like Epsom salt baths, mud baths, sauna, so that you're detoxing out whatever you're killing off, basically. 
and binders, of course. If you're killing things, you're going to get endotoxin. So beat the bugs would be, I grab one botanical avatar that fits them in the morning, and then a calming one that fits them at night, like albizia. And then we might need to add antimicrobials on top of that, which could be plant-based or it could be pharmaceutical. It just totally depends on how severe the situation is. The thing that people don't really realize is they have to be on these antimicrobials a long time. So there's a treatment phase and then there's a prophylaxis phase. And once that continuum is switched over into autoimmune, we're talking a year or more that they're going to have to be on something to support, something to beat the bug, something. <laughs> Otherwise, I can guarantee you we're going to be staying, staying in this flare, flare trough, flare trough cycle forever. Because if it takes about three months for one of those cycles, we need about four cycles. We need to get through supporting about four cycles before we can kind of feel like maybe now we can take our foot off the gas pedal a little bit and see how much coast this body has. And of course, at the same time, we're doing the regulating immunity. So we're building up the gut flora. We're building with vitamin D, vitamin A, all of the things that we see round up reduce and mold reduce. And so, you know, putting in those nutrients, I do like exosomes if needed, if a kid is in a flare before we would go to IVIG, just to see if we can save them that treatment. But it's not uncommon for kids to need regular IVIG treatment during that time period when we're trying to give them a few cycles. And then with guarding the gates, I kind of have that's core four, but there are four gates we want to watch. We want to watch the sinus gate, which I think we've made the argument for why that is the case. We want to watch the throat gate, because if they do have a throat infection, our body will send that to the, the lymph nodes in the neck and then send the antibodies back up to the throat, but also to the nose. So it'll compromise the nasal gate once more. So, you know, this is really simple. There are studies where they had kids um, chew xylitol gum for five minutes after every meal. And they saw a drastic reduction in the strep in their mouth, the bad strep. We have mm -hmm. most of the strep on our body is good strep. So strep is not bad. You heard it here. Not all strep is bad, but it's the group A beta hemolymic strep. That's the problem. And xylitol knocks it out. And it also knocks out strep mutans, which is what's in our, what causes dental caries. So chewing gum, like what kid? Okay, you better chew your gum now. You know, yeah. what kid is going to be like, no, no, no. I chew my xylitol gum every day. <laughs> I do. I'm smart. A, I should yeah. really be better about that. And then our exposure gate, which is the obvious things that we've been talking about today. Mitigate, mitigate everywhere that you can reduce those exposures because those you're little by little taking the straws off the camel's back. So the kid can have a regular infection, have a regular mount, a regular immune response and move past it like normal. Yes. Kids. Yeah. And I think having the tools to like you mentioned resiliency, you know, I'm, I always have to throw an exercise because an exercising yeah. kid is a sleeping kid and a sleeping kid yeah. is a healthier kid. So yeah. making sure that the, these kids are not moving today in today's day and age, we do not have like you and I probably got thrown outside until the streetlights came on, you know, That's right. like, good luck, have fun. Don't My go kids too far. Too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I actually had, um, this is about me, but um, I, I saw it in practice as well. When we're like, you got to get outside. Your kids have to get outside. I had some parents like come to my door and be like, did you know your kids are out without supervision? And I'm like, yeah, it's all right. You know, they're, <laughs> they're on their bikes. They're going to be fine. Yeah. So funny. Yeah. So that's in the, that's in part three structure, family structure, mm -hmm structure routine adrenals love routine so routinize your life as much as possible structure to your your exercise routine structured water this is a miracle for neuroinflammation um so you know all of these things that have to do with structural alignment and then i i do talk a lot about structural alignment in that section because this like one dental trip even if they didn't have pandas or pans if they had that many straws stacked against, and then you have your mouth held open. You, you as a chiropractor know what's happening there with the neck. We've just kinked off all the glymphatics. Mm -hmm. So the, the brain can't drain. So in all of my patients who have pandas and pans, once it's tripped into autoimmune, I say, you must, must, must follow dental trips with either a craniosacral appointment, definitely craniosacral chiropractor. Something is going to help with that alignment. Otherwise we're there sitting duck for the next thing that comes down the pike. Such good advice. I'm always a fan of the cervical adjustments. Yeah. 
especially mm-hmm. in kids. It's, it's such a, it's a game changer. You can completely change a child's behavior by getting regular chiropractic adjustments. Mm-hmm. It's wild. I've seen it repeatedly. I, I lived it. My, that was the one doctor that I went to consistently that I liked going to. Cause I went to a lot of doctors as a kid. I was always in and out of ex, you know, specialist offices and mm-hmm. the chiropractors were always the, they were the best. They talked yeah. to me. I didn't know about naturopathic doctors then. So I would probably add that to the list too. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask you a question though? Cause I want to go back to sauna. I think that, um, I think that sauna is such a powerful tool and it's something that there's different, different types of saunas. I like sunlight and sauna. I think there's different saunas for different price points, but what is a, like for a child, let's say a 10 year old, you know, someone that's not, cause I know with young, young kids and with old, old adults, we have to be super careful with temperature. Mm-hmm. But when we're talking like mm-hmm. a tent cause I, the, the pans and pandas I've seen on set were around like eight to 11 year olds. I don't know if that's the, is that generally a, an age group that it tends to hit? It can be earlier. Yeah. It can okay. be like seven, six, seven, late sixes. <laughs> so these yeah. kids, uh, how would they use binders and sauna? Yeah, you, we, I basically take a gentle approach with that. And we see that in studies, these are clinical studies, 125 degrees for 20 minutes in an adult is enough to move mycotoxins out and see a tenfold increase in urine mycotoxin count. Wow. Tenfold. So um, in a kid, then what we do is I try to do about 120, if they can handle it for about 10 minutes. And I haven't tested actually a pre and post like we've done in adults. Um, but you know, I mean, we see reduction, we see reduction in the flares we might say, but we do need to have, make sure because the mast cells are such a part of this, that we preload them with things that will reduce the mast cells. So we might do like a luteolin perilla beforehand, and then, you know, using, I don't use a ton of binders with kids. We might do a charcoal or something like that at the sauna time. Yeah. Okay. Or following the sauna. Yeah. I'm but mast cells are a real problem with these pandas pants kids. They can, they can really flare when we okay. get them too hot or too, you know, the exercise or those kinds of things, even a hot shower can set them off. So they need, definitely need some kind of pre mast cell stabilizer typically. Okay. That's good information to have for the audience because that is uh, definitely a concern that I had in my head. I mm-hmm. think, I I'm think, that, I mm-hmm. think that with, with children though, the hopeful part is they heal very quickly in comparison to adults. And so just to bring some light to this, I think that I've seen a lot of these kids turn around with really good naturopathic care and, or at least come back to a level that's really reasonable compared to where they were. And so, you know, kids heal, that's, that's their job. That's what they do. Right. And if you have a kid like the lived next to a farm, uh, like a, uh, sprayed uh, field, there's the word. Like me, like, uh, 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 yeah. Can you tell that's, uh, uh, that's my exposure? Um, and they can't tolerate sauna. You can do foot baths to get their load down. This is one of the few things I'm seeing. Um, it's the glyphosate kind of hangs out at the voltage gated channels, which is why we can see a lot of neurological hiccups, basically. So when we can move the glyphosate off using a foot bath. Then they can get their mast cell irritation down, and then they can move to sauna for the mycotoxin piece. I haven't seen foot baths be really profound for the mycotoxins. Sauna is definitely in the the um, mud is good for the inflammation. Um, so you can do foot baths and mud baths. So mud of the body, feet in a foot bath, and this is where there's an electrical current going into the foot bath. Then you get their glyphosate load down and then you can do sauna without so much of the flare and they can get that bioaccumulation part down through the sauna. Awesome. I love it. This is so interesting. I always love talking to you. I do the same. Oh, that's so nice of you. I, I, I'm, I'm always like, I've got Jill Krista on text message. I, <laughs> I've got like quick access. I know all the things. It's pretty fun. It's pretty you fun. You know more to- than, uh, than people probably would want to know. So yeah. <laughs> Between you and some of my other smarty pants friends, I feel like a superhero. All these, I, I love having you guys on my podcast because I so hope that more, you know, I just really the podcast is just about obviously spreading information, but exposing people to folks like you, experts like you, and then concepts that they maybe hadn't thought of, or even hearing some of the same things that I talk about in a different way as being yeah. 
you know, I'll say it a little bit differently. Yeah. Hopefully well, I hope that, you know, we've talked about a lot of problem, problem, scary, scary, and some solutions, but the main thing is you are the parent and you know, your kid, like if there's a parting thought, it is trust your child. You don't have, it's not bad parenting and you don't have a broken kid. You have a sick kid and you're a perfectly fine parent. They just need treatment. That is the way to go and trust them. <laughs> and trust, trust the, their timeline. As a very yeah. sick kid, I think just allowing the child to heal at the rate they're going to heal is, yeah. you talked yeah. a lot about kind of peeling layers off and that's all part of it. It's, we can't slam these kids with aggressive treatments always, you know, and the, right. in the allopathic model and even in the functional medicine model, sometimes I see things go way too fast. And that's why I bring up sauna again is because hydrotherapy, you know, you're a naturopathic doctor, hydrotherapy which you've mentioned so many aspects of foot baths, mm -hmm. mud baths, you know, sauna, these are therapeutics that are individualized for the user. And they're so beautiful that way. And so protocols of like this temperature for this amount of time. Yeah. It's nice to refer to studies, but I think importantly too, just knowing where we are at that day, where your child is at that day is mm. going to dictate any therapy. Yeah. particularly hydrotherapy, and it can be customized to your needs or your child's needs on that very day, right? Some of us don't get a lot of sleep the night before our central nervous system is messed up. We can't handle a hotter temperature or a right. colder, you know, so I'm not such a fan of the ice baths and the hot, hot sauna. I'm a fan of meeting your body where it's at and using these therapeutics to nudge the vitality along instead of slamming it into a door. Right, right. However, you know, our, our mentors used cold water therapy. They would put kids like this in cold water. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. I'm all for it. I just, we've got to like, yeah, uh, that's not the same terrain. We're not dealing with the same terrain anymore. We are right. not. Right. Yeah. We, we don't want to, I had a lot of shock and awe as a patient, as a child, I had a lot of things done to me against my will. And it really set me up for a lot of PTSD and to the point where I don't even want to walk in a doctor's office anymore. I don't like doctors. Yeah. <laughs> That's, why, doctor. <laughs> That's why I became one. Cause I, people walk in my office. They're like, I don't like doctors. I'm like, neither do I. Uh, yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Dr. Jill, where can everybody find you? You have so many wonderful um, opportunities for people to learn from you. Yeah, they can find me at drkrista.com. That's D-R-C-R-I-S-T-A.com. I have a recent course out called Mold in Kids. So it takes the things I talk about for adults in my book and it applies it to children. So there's a lot of hydrotherapy in there. There's a lot of, you know, more gentle things that you can do. Um, and then with my Pandas book, the probably the key tool in that is a medication compatibility chart. And you can get that on my website by going to drkrista.com slash med dash compatibility. You don't have to buy the book. This, what this does is this goes through all of the medications that are typically used with a pandas pants kid and all of the natural things that we would use and tells you what things can be used together and where you might need a dose adjustment. So I wanted this to be a huge tool for parents to take the fear out of combining regular conventional medicine. Cause some of these kids really need that. A lot of kids need IVIG. A lot of kids need some kind of anti-inflammatory in the beginning. So now, you know, or, or antihistamine. So you'll know which herbs that you can use together safely and nutrients. So that's, oh, a, that is, that's my gift to everybody. <laughs> that is a huge gift. That's amazing. I can't imagine what the amount of time that took to put together. Yeah. And that's on your website. Yeah. That's on my website. Yep. Okay, and you can cool. download it from there and I'll update it regularly if I have more information, but I ran it by our colleagues who were dual degreed the farm D and the naturopathic doctors. And, you know, so it's been vetted, um, by many experts, not just, you know, what I found in books, but I love it. And then you're on Instagram. Yeah. I'm on Instagram, Dr. Jill Krista, and there are lots of more, um, Facebook. I'm not so, yeah, this, if I can cross post to Facebook, it goes on there. And then on YouTube. I have a lot awesome. of little pearls, video pearls that I put up there. And because people have neuroinflammation, have, have brain fog, they are very short. So there's over a hundred teeny short focus topic bites that you can get information out there. Oh, I'd love it. You're such a gift to the world, Jill. I'm so honored to meet, to know you as a friend. And oh. it, I remember meeting you and I was like, she's a, she's an enchantress 
Like you're one of the Jedi's. <laughs> That's because you saw me getting out of the ocean after my dolphin experience. That's true. <laughs> oh my God. That's so sweet. That's um, true. You know, That's true. I adore you. I adore your, your brain. Like you were such a gift when, when COVID came out, it was like, I know I could just go to your podcast and you'd have Quran on and, you know, all these people and you had such good questions and you actually read, you don't just wait for the highlights to come out or, you know, watch it on a video or whatever. So I just really, I appreciate that so much about you and your fight. I hope uh, you know that you've got support. Thank you. I know I, I rely on you guys heavily, so I appreciate it. Awesome. Okay. Everybody head over to Jill, Dr. Jill's website. I'll have everything in the show notes and you can also find her on the social medias there. And, uh, I hope that you'll come back and we can have a conversation of more in depth about mold. You bet. I love talking about mold. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for being on the Dr. Tina show, Dr. Jill. Thanks for having me. 